The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate and collaborate. Introducing Sign Institute Fellow 2022, Shannon Watts. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, grateful you're back for the second discussion around um, gun violence prevention and activism. And I'm so excited to kick this session off with a, a discussion with a good friend of mine, Congresswoman Marie Newman, who is here from Illinois. Hello, Congresswoman, how are you? How is everyone? Good to be here. We're so thrilled that you joined us today. As you may know, we're having this discussion that's, that's really about activism. And today in particular, we're talking about the legislative process, which you are familiar with both as an activist and now as a lawmaker. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? How did you get involved in, in the political world? And then how did you come to be a Congresswoman? Well, um... I think activism is the operative word here is that um, while really passionate about uh, gun reform and gun safety, very passionate for years about income inequity um, and issues of equity across the spectrum where there's housing, education, employment, and on and on, um, had been involved in things like uh, before it was sexy, $15 an hour and healthcare rights 20 years ago and, and on and on. So um, not no stranger to any of those advocacy topics and had um, done activism uh, most of my life. Going back to the time I was 14, I um, started an immigration uh, organization inside my church that um, uh, helped people with uh, uh, meal and uh, food insecurity. Um, so over time, when I got very supercharged involved into the uh, gun safety movement, this is probably 25 years ago, roughly, um, I I really realized that um, gun reform is at the nexus of um, inequity, racism, and um, many of the issues attached to um, America's challenges right now and, and then at that time. Um, so I had gotten involved with a, a organization that is now defunct called Million Mom March and had been organized with them for a long time. And my journey with gun reform ebbed and flowed right in between my other activism. I also um, joined the anti-bullying movement and did uh, I started a nonprofit around that and, and did that for several years. I wrote a book on it and was a spokesperson. Um, but what the commonality here is, is that um, justice and equity um, is a problem in our nation. Um, and what I realized is that that was the common thread through all of my topics of activism. So um, when I got engaged with uh, Moms Demand Action, this is probably five or six years ago, I realized they had an amazing model for activism, but also legislative advocacy and partnering with legislators. And so I learned so much through that journey when I was an advocate um, working um, towards bills um, in, in my home state in Illinois, um, the amazing moms there were able to get uh, four or five bills passed in the last four or five years as a result of the um, amazing model that uh, within which they operated uh, called Moms Demand Action. So when I decided to run four years ago, and as many know, I, I lost my first race, first race by about 2%. Uh, I was um, held up on the shoulders of moms um, the entire time. I mean, it was it was um, the basis of my, my volunteer movement. And 
my, my volunteer movement was the jam is that that's what got that job done, you know, in the second time in particular. So, um, so I came to Congress through um, this, this sphere of understanding the importance of activism and um, legislative uh, advocacy. So I'm um, so pleased to be here, but so proud to still be working with Moms Demand. Congresswoman, can you talk a little bit about legislating? You were saying, you know, you were on one side of the issue when you were an activist, right? And you were pushing for certain legislation. Um, you were meeting with lawmakers. You, know, you were part of the process on a very different level. Then you become a lawmaker. And now you're part of the process of actually creating the legislation. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like and, and were there was there anything that surprised you as you became a lawmaker? You know what's interesting is that when I was advocating um, and I was a volunteer for uh, moms and other organizations too, um, it was um, clear that um, lawmakers were just as exasperated as we were. I mean, honestly, and you've experienced this many times too, um, uh, Shannon, is that um, this, this is exasperating for lawmakers. And that certainly proved to be the um, case. I think the only surprise I had coming to Congress was the fact that literally um, it is the first time in our history on an issue where we have over 90% agreement across the nation, across socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity, um, type of job, gender, like everything, right? We have, we have unanimity um, uh, just in a very strong way. It's the only issue that has not moved forward. And what we know, and we know this, knew this going in, but it was put a fine point on it, is that it is all about the money. It is all about the money. So the reason we can't get Republicans in the Senate to move over, because um, there's a couple in, in uh, the House that would move over, um, is because of the money. And so what I... More so than ever before, I am a champion of uh, campaign finance reform for those reasons. Um, and it is directly tied to our gun safety movement. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question for you, for you about the Supreme Court. And, and you know, they're, they're talking about, uh, they're, they're going to be um, taking on a case around this issue. You know, what's your feeling about the impact of this new Supreme Court, which, which looks different than it has uh, in quite some time? It, it does look different, but you know what? Um, uh, uh, shame on me, shame on everybody for not seeing this 20 years ago. We saw the, the courts changing 20 years ago. We saw school boards, um, forest preserve boards, um, state reps, state senate, it all was changing before our eyes and we weren't probably addressing it as aggressively as we should have been. So now it should be no surprise that the Supreme Court is made up of people that were in the low, lower courts that were just as conservative, but made their way up. Um, so, so for me, there, there's, a, many of you know that there's an expand the court um, piece of legislation out there. My, my good friend Mondaire Jones is leading that effort. And I am thrilled if we could get that passed, that would be amazing um, because we have plenty of precedent. There have been, several other decades in which there have been nine, 11 or 15 uh, judges on the Supreme Court, which is far fairer. We can do it. Is it that we, does everybody have the will and the, um, uh, the empowerment to do it? So I desperately want us to have a larger court so that we can even it out and balance it out. And because right now it's just plain old extremists, let's call it what it is, we're just extremists. Congresswoman, you know, it's difficult to pass legislation through Congress, uh, especially given the way uh, the U.S. Senate is right now. I always say the only place where gun safety is polarizing is actually in the U.S. Senate, not anywhere else. Um, you know, as, as an activist, can you speak to the importance of also more local legislating, right? So state houses, school boards, city councils. As a member of Congress now, how do you view that work? It is, uh, it is everything right now making sure that we get more uh, people with reason voices into um, school boards, township supervisors, state rep positions, state senate positions, statewide positions. It is critically important because we have had our eye off the ball. What that does is because all those people move up the food chain and go to Congress and the Senate, right? And to the cabinet. And we need more uh, you know, uh, contemporary voices because a lot of these voices are like living in 1965. 
I, and I'm not exaggerating, just yeah. attitudinally. Um, so, for, so for me, um, it is critically important that um, everybody that listening here um, should either support someone that has a strong voice on gun safety and gun reform um, at the school board level, the um, state rep level, the state senate and statewide level. Please, please get, get engaged because th this is how we're going to turn things around. And, you know, what, Congresswoman, I think what I have been so shocked by when I became an activist, I don't know if you had the same experience, I kind of assumed my lawmakers wanted to hear from me. And maybe this has changed, you know, uh, over the last few years, but very often they have their own agenda. Uh, they're not that interested in hearing from you. And, and in fact, you know, you can have a majority pushing hard on them and they still do the bidding of a lobbyist group. Have you as a congressperson now or, or as an activist found ways that are most effective to sway lawmakers, to change hearts and minds, or, or even just to, you know, because they're embarrassed of taking the wrong position, act the right way on, on a piece of legislation? It is, um, it is a full court press, right? Two is that um, your colleagues have to pressure other colleagues. The grassroots has to pressure those people that um, uh, don't understand the importance of um, gun safety and gun reform. Um, and it is, we've, we've got to get those lobbyist groups out of the picture. So lobbyists don't even bother with me. They're like, oh my God, she's an immovable force. That lady, oh, all right. Um, so, uh, so I don't, th that's not an issue for me. I, I don't get influenced by one and I don't take corporate money, but um, those that do, um, we really have to pressure them from it. So it's my job to pressure them as a colleague. It is the grassroots drops and then um, executive leaders like you, Shannon, and, and you're not alone. There are others that pressure them. And it is just constant. I mean, we, it, it is, you know, I, I can see a little bit of movement in a couple of places in uh, the Senate, but remember, we have to fix some structural rules too, is that we have the filibuster. And the filibuster is the singular most important reason why we do not have gun reform because Schumer won't bring, as you know, you know of this, uh, Schumer won't bring it to the floor, right? Because he knows that he doesn't have 60 votes. You know, wh why bother? Um, so if we get rid of the filibuster, and the requirement to have 60 votes, um, I think things like um, gun reform are gonna happen like that. Do you see any way to pass gun safety or frankly, any kind of social justice legislation through the entire Congress? Is it a matter of changing hearts and minds? Is it a matter of political pressure? Is it a matter of electoral change and, and electing lawmakers who will do the right thing? What, what is your, now that you're there, you're sitting in Washington, DC, what's your view? It's all of those, but the singular most, if you have to choose one of those three things, Shannon, I would say it is uh, uh, choosing better politicians um, to send to the Senate in particular, because honestly, the house is not the problem. We can probably, I know it's, there's a lot of um, hand wringing out there right now, and, uh, but we, we're probably gonna keep the house by a small, small margin. Might be even smaller margin than the four people we have right now. Mm. Uh, but I think we're gonna keep the house, but help every member of Congress, by the way. Um, but in the Senate, it's probably gonna stay the same. And God forbid we you know, have the majority flip because um, then we're just not gonna get anything done, like zero. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, support a Senate race uh, for sure, but we, it has to be that we change who is in that institution and choose people that are not beholden to um, corporate PACs. We have a question for you from a Moms Demand Action volunteer, and I see this a lot, um, this idea of, look, we're so frustrated with yeah. federal inaction on this issue and, and, and other issues too, right? Yeah. Um, why should I bother voting for this administration or, or anyone you know, who is in Congress? And, yeah. and I hear that a lot. And yet, uh, you know, it's this idea of co-equal branches of government and who has power and, and, and the fact that we only have a slim majority in the Senate. But I'm interested in what you have to say about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I echo that. I, I have a hard time voting because <laughs> it's like get something done. Um, so I hear you. Um, what is what is the reason for that? Well, the re the reason we keep going is because, and I'll tell you, um, uh, um, best practices and historical reference. Right, it, it, we know that uh, things like civil rights took over a hundred years to get passed. Over a hundred years. 
Um, you know, we've probably been working in vigor on gun safety and reform for probably really 50 years and with real vigor, right? Um, and 30 years with lots of vigor, right? So um, other things, you know, it, it just it, think about like, it's a different issue, but there's some analogy here is that like um, um, safety belts and cigarettes, right? That, that took 30, 40, 50 years to um, get it passed. These are all things that had huge majorities. Again, 90% of the population in the, in the nation um, felt strongly about it, but it just takes decades. So think about this now, let's say that we're 30 years into that very vigorous movement. What if we all keep going, keep going, and within the next five years, we get what we need? So now is not the time to stop. Now yeah. we're almost there. If, if, historic, if history uh, proves um, informational uh, moving forward, uh, past as prologue, right? Um, then we're almost there, guys. So now is not the time to stop. You keep supporting um, great candidates that don't accept corporate money and great candidates that work hard and great candidates that will become senators or are running for Senate now. Those are the people that we work really hard for and we wear out our shoes for, like we all have. We've all worn yeah. out shoes um, walking on doors. And, and you're in the middle of a, a race right now. And so if anyone's in Illinois and, and interested in helping out, um, you're in the thick of it. Let me ask you this final question. Sure. A lot of the people who are watching this today are college age. Mm -hmm. um, they may be considering running for office or they may just be activists who want to create change, force change through advocacy. Mm -hmm. Any advice you would give them as they, they think about politics and, and graduating and what's next? Do it. <laughs> Just do it. Do not let, oh gosh, I don't have this experience or I don't have that experience or I don't have the money or whatever. Just do it. Um, I didn't have money and I, I, I never, before, Ian, you know this, Shannon, is that um, before I ran for Congress in 2017, I had never even run for student council. <laughs> so, Imagine leapfrogging. I mean, so the, the it, it's it's not always. A, in fact, I would say that um, I, I've been outspent in all three of my election cycles, um, pretty dramatically, and I've won every time. Um, now you do need money. I'm not going to you know be ready to fundraise. And by the way, it is what I absolutely hate the most about this job. It is vile. I hate it. Hate it. Hate it. That's how you have to do it. Um, so. Um, Know that you're going to be fundraising, know that you're going to be wearing out shoes, know that you're going to be um, working 24-7. Um, but get knowledgeable um, and work with, you know, like Demand a Seed is a great mm -hmm. program here um, with Moms Demand Action. She runs uh, Vote for Her. There's a million of them uh, that will help you get ready to be a candidate. So be a knowledgeable candidate. Make sure you know all the issues and make sure you know how to be a candidate. But just do it. That's great advice. I hope people who are watching us are considering actually getting into politics right out of college. You know, the average age a woman runs for office is 47. I don't know how old you were, but you know, they wait until they think, oh, I've had my career or I've had my family or whatever it is, or, or you know, women often think they have to be perfect or they have to have all this experience, um, a gating factor that, that men don't always have. And so I would just encourage everyone who's watching us to think about running for office and you're a great example of, of what you can do. That's right. That's right. And and you do not wait. Now, sometimes you do have to wait because, you know, uh, daycare is not available <laughs> on the same trail. I will say that there was one of the factors for me, which is why I started later. But um, don't let that be an encumbrance. Um, figure it out and, and get out there. And um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank this amazing group uh, being interested in this topic. And Shannon, thank you for always being an amazing advocate for, um, for advocacy as a topic. Um, you've just done a tremendous job and I'm so indebted to you for not only um, creating Moms Demand Action, but just legions of women that are so empowered and, you know, like Lucy McBath and I, that, you know, that we were inspired by you and we are where we are in Congress today because of you. So, so thank you. And thank you to this great audience at SCENE. I, I, I'm thrilled that you're doing this kind of work with them. Thank you so much. And if people want to find out more about you, what's your, remind us what your website is. So my, um, my, on the, uh, campaign side, it's uh, Marie Newman for congress.com. And on the official side, all you have to do is just uh, pop in uh, Representative Marie Newman, and it'll pop up for you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Congresswoman. Thank you. And keep going, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. 
Okay, well, that was, I think, a, a great uh, starter. And, and feel free to um, ask questions as we go along. I'll, I'll keep checking the Q&A. Thank you for those questions during that conversation with the Congresswoman. I'm going to share my screen with all of you here. Um, so today we're talking about legislation, and hopefully you have been able to join us uh, for the first session where I sort of level set who Moms Demand Action is and what we do, but just as a brief synopsis, uh, Moms Demand Action is now the largest grassroots movement in the country, along with Students Demand Action. We are under the umbrella of Every Town for Gun Safety, and we work on the issue of gun violence prevention. We work on it um, legislatively, which we're going to talk about today, how we've done that. We've, we work on it electorally, which we're going to talk about next time, uh, March 14th. Please join us. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we work on it culturally uh, at a later date. And uh, I'm hopeful I'll be in person with all of you next month and, and handing out copies of my book, Fight Like a Mother, which is the whole basis of, of these sessions and these discussions. Um, I wrote exactly about all of this in that book because I had so many people say to me, you know, what, um, what was your formula? How did you do this? How could I do something like this in my city, my state, in the country? And not even just on the issue of guns, on, on any issue. So I'm excited to uh, delve more into that with all of you in the coming months. So today, um, we already spoke with uh, Congresswoman Newman. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the history of the movement and what our strategy has been uh, around legislation, how we legislated in those early days. Um, we've learned a lot and how we've evolved and what is our strategy today, uh, nearly a decade later, how we win. I think it's a really important conversation, um, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we lose because that's how you learn. And then we're going to end uh, today's session with a discussion with Congresswoman Lucy McBath, as long as we can pull her off the floor, uh, and, and then next steps. So the history of the movement, um, you know, I, I think it's so important to look at social movements in context. Um, when you look at the gun violence prevention movement, if you go back uh to 2012 and you look at where the gun lobby was and i'll talk a little bit about how they got there but the gun lobby was incredibly well organized they uh, had been working for years to become a political machine to become one of the largest uh, most well-funded most sophisticated special interests that has ever existed they watched and learned from other special interests like tobacco and the alcohol industry and how they tackled things like uh, smoking um, and, and, and when the studies came out that showed that it caused cancer, uh, when the alcohol lobby was challenged on drunk driving regulations, um, they, they learned a lot from that. And uh, they've been very savvy and very canny around getting what they needed to make sure that they were um, able to take advantage of power and money and relationships with lawmakers. They had a very specific agenda. The NRA's agenda was flying through state houses, uh, through the Capitol in DC, uh, even through city councils. I mean, the, the NRA um, has been an incredibly savvy force for lawmaking for now, uh, since about 1975. Um, in addition, they had a really, uh, robust membership. Now, that membership, and, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, it was mainly, it looked like an average gun owner, right? The average gun owner in this country, at least pre-pandemic, was a white man over the age of 50. Um, and, and that's a very specific demographic. The NRA claims to have 5 million members. Uh, there are a lot of reporters and media that question that. Um, a lot of times you have to subscribe to be a member of the NRA if you, for example, want to be part of their mailing list or get their magazine or even if you buy a gun. Um, and so those numbers may be a bit skewed, but certainly uh, a very large and powerful membership. And then if you look at the gun violence prevention movement in 2012, um, and I talked about this in our last session, you know, when I went online to find something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that's really what I wanted to join after the Sandy Hook school shooting. And I, I should mention, and I will mention this again, but today uh, it's been four years since the very deadly shooting at Parkland. 
um, school in, in Florida. And um, so many people got off the sidelines and got involved, but they certainly have been a force for, for organizing in this movement. But if you go back to 2012, we're looking at mainly city organizations, uh, mostly run by men, state organizations here and there, again, mostly run by men, none with a very robust membership or volunteer base, um, and a whole lot of think tanks run by what you would consider elites, right? People who are very uh, either wealthy or inside the beltway, um, white men, like it just was not um, a very diverse or large movement. Um, it was very fractured. There were people very much on the left who were focused on uh, things like assault weapons, and then there were people who were to the right, uh, and they were focused on um, much more um, hyper local or pragmatic efforts. And then, um, as I said, think tanks were really having debate and discussion and coming up with sort of esoteric or lofty uh, goals and ideas that didn't necessarily meet uh, the emotion of an average everyday American who wanted to get involved in this issue. So if you go back, the NRA was founded uh, in 1871 a very long time ago, and they were founded uh, as sort of a marksman's organization, uh, gun safety, shooting, uh, very male focused um, around hunting activities. And they sort of stayed that way for close to 100 years. Um, and then what happened was in 1968, uh, and, and this was, you know, after the shooting deaths of, of many high profile um, political beloved people in, in the country, there was the Gun Control Act of 1968. And this really created a uh, some some very specific restrictions around categories and classes of firearms, um, including uh, a ban on machine guns, things like that. And this so outraged uh, the gun lobby and, and some of its uh, members and followers that in the 1970s, the, the people who were sort of Second Amendment ab ab absolutists, not abolitionists, absolutists, um, they, they were able to amass power and they were able to take away the power from, from the people who were leading the organization. And there was sort of a coup in the middle of one of their, their meetings as an organization. And, and that is really um, a turning point for the NRA when it became this extremist organization that believed um, that they should really be focused on lobbying, they should be focused on lawmaking, um, that they should be amassing political power and wealth in order to have a very specific agenda around firearms. And it, it didn't take them that long. Uh, when you look at social movements in this country, 16 years or so uh, from the 70s to, to 1986 is not a very long time. I mean, it just goes to show you how quickly um, they were able to create political power and wealth. And they really had their first legislative victory as an organization in 1986. And this was the Firearms Owners Protection Act, and it rolled back a lot of the Gun Control Act of 1968. Um, and, and what the NRA learned during this entire campaign and, and victory for them was that they could use rhetoric and right-wing dogma to raise money for the organization. And, and what's interesting is that that is, that is how that political strategy started. They did not create this rhetoric in order to ch advance a legislative agenda. They created that rhetoric in order to raise money and it ended up leaking into their political agenda. Um, in 1994, 95, um, after, uh, the the Waco tragedy, Wayne LaPierre, and um, it's kind of interesting, Wayne LaPierre was actually a special education teacher and ended up sort of becoming a gun rights lobbyist uh, out of nowhere. Uh, he was not a gun guy. He was sort of more a, a, a policy wonk and a DC guy. Um, but, but in the mid 90s is when uh, they sent out an email talking about jack booted thugs going into people's homes and taking their guns. And that is when uh, President George Bush Sr. resigned from the organization. And it sort of drew this red line of were you on the side of extremism in the NRA or were you on the side of, of sort of common sense, which is where most of America lives, um, but not the NRA. And then uh, another 
important moment, I think, for the organization, for the NRA, was um, after the Columbine tragedy in 1999 and 2000, um, when they had their legislative meeting that was scheduled to be in Denver, Colorado. The Columbine mass shooting was just outside of Denver. And all of this, um, tapes of these discussions was released recently where the NRA's leaders were having discussions and trying to decide what do we do as an organization now that this tragedy has happened? Do we back down? Do we double down? And those who wanted to double down won out, um, including uh, one of their lobbyists uh, is, a, is a leader in Florida and has been for a very long time. And she really was the one pushing and saying, we should double down because if we back down at all, if we give an inch, we will have to capitulate on everything. And so that is when um, the organization had their meeting and uh, Charlton Heston said, you know, you would have to pry his guns from his cold dead hands. Uh, and then there was another very poignant moment after the Sandy Hook school shooting, when uh, once again, there was a debate within the organization, should we back down, should we double down? Uh, and they waited two weeks as an organization to come out after the Sandy Hook school shooting. And as we all know, uh, they doubled down. And that was the speech Wayne LaPierre gave where he said, uh, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And they refused to, um, to moderate. They refused to have any conversations about, for example, background check legislation that was proposed in honor of the victims um, that failed in the, in the Senate. And uh, it, it really was sort of a fateful moment for the organization and, and really was a, a forward look at what they would do um, with Donald Trump and, and gun extremists that, that have really become insurrectionists and a dangerous power in this country now. So the good news is though, if you fast forward to 2022, um, the gun lobby is sort of a shadow of its former self. Uh, we were able to outspend the gun lobby in, in uh, 2018, and, and we'll, I'll explain that story, but, but the gun lobby is really in many ways weakened. They are fractured. Uh, they are under investigation on several fronts. Um, they have partnered with extremists so often that they're really out of the mainstream. Um, we all know, hopefully, that uh, the that Wayne LaPierre himself is under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, he certainly doesn't act like someone who operates a nonprofit. Uh, he is uh, funding Italian suits from Beverly Hills and private jet travel and um, even vacation rentals on the backs of NRA members. Uh, that's not how most nonprofits act. Um, the NRA's agenda now um, is, is very specific, but not broad. They have some wins still, for example, permitless carry which they've now passed in 21 states. That is legislation that removes the um, requirement that you have a permit in order to carry a concealed loaded handgun in public. Um, this is their dream as, a, as an organization to pass that, but now what it looks like is that's getting passed in a lot of red states. And then the same exact number of, of states actually have background checks. But, but the NRA's agenda, because they're constantly being opposed by us, um, it has gotten very narrow and very specific, but that doesn't mean they don't have wins. And then their demographic. As I mentioned, the average NRA member is a, a white man over the age of, of 50 or 60. That was pre-pandemic. Um, the NRA was able to uh, manipulate and um, sort of demagogue the tragedy of, of the pandemic and sell tens of millions of guns, many to first-time gun owners, um, and we have also seen more people of color and more women buying guns, which um, I think will change the, the discussion and the debate around this issue for uh, many years in the future. Um, but at the same time, we have become more well organized and I'll go into to how, but um, we have a very specific agenda as does the NRA. And, and we now have a volunteer base, which is something we never had in the past. So if you go back to 2012, when the Sandy Hook school shooting happened, the very end in December, as I mentioned, you know, the NRA had been amassing power and their their agenda was really sailing through state houses and um, they had become really powerful. And there was really one main organization, uh, the Brady organization, and they had had successfully passed legislation in the 90s to require a background check on licensed gun sales, but 
in many ways, the movement had stalled. Um, and, and that's in part because it lacked money. Uh, there was not a lot of money flowing in either from individual donors or from uh, large uh, donors, including philanthropists. Um, some would say their, their policy goals weren't realistic. They didn't jibe with what the average American wanted and, and thought was realistic, uh, along with the people who were in Congress and in power uh, in state houses. And also, they didn't really have a, a strong message that inspired everyday Americans to get off the sidelines. Now, I would say um, the, the one blip in that I should mention is that, um, and Marie talked about um, the, the march, the One Million Moms March that happened right after the Columbine shooting. Um, and, and, you know, I took a lot from that march. I, I think I learned a lot in retrospect. I was a very young mom and I wasn't involved, but I think the the mistake that was made was that it was just a march and that march didn't turn into grassroots organizing. Um, but that was obviously after Columbine, it was a, it was a powerful moment and a powerful time, um, but it did not result in, in any grassroots organizations ultimately um, or any legislation being passed. So when the Sandy Hook school shooting happened, which is one of the worst school shooting tragedies in this country's history, um, I think it, it really did uh, speak to moms in particular again, much like Columbine did. And we began organizing. Um, first, we had rallies and marches, but then what we realized was that we really needed an organization that could go toe to toe with the gun lobby. That had never existed. We needed the same kind of members and donors uh, and strategy. And so we we are now a movement uh, bolstered by philanthropists. Um, Mayor Mike Bloomberg is a, a major donor to Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action, which is under the auspices now of uh, Every Town, which I co-founded with him. Um, gives tens and tens, probably hundreds of millions of dollars at this point um, to keep the movement going, to make sure that we're able to organize, to make sure that we're able to donate to candidates. Um, on top of that, I think that that social media was a very important piece of this. Um, it was how uh, we were able to communicate. You know, I often wonder if you go back to um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, how did they communicate with people to organize around legislation or to show up at a rally? I mean, did they call each other on their rotary phone? Did they drive over to each other's homes? Did they mail letters? I mean, that they accomplished all they did in under a decade, I think is truly outstanding and amazing. And I, I don't know how we would have done everything we have done without social media. It's been just absolutely invaluable in terms of being able to put pressure on lawmakers um, to tell stories uh, and also to organize um, our own volunteers and encourage new people to join the fold. And then pragmatism. Um, sometimes pragmatism and incrementalism can be considered dirty words in activism, and yet it's like drips on a rock, right? The system is not set up for, for overnight change. It's really about relentless incre incrementalism that leads to revolutions. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned uh, four years ago today, uh, 17 people were shot and killed inside uh, a high school in Parkland, Florida. And after that horrific shooting tragedy, we saw young people organizing, right? It wasn't just middle-aged moms and, and people um, who, who were parents. It was also children and teens and college-aged students who uh, wanted to get off the sidelines and get involved in this issue and apply pressure to lawmakers, which of course happened through the March for Our Lives in uh, 2018, which had millions of people in attendance all across the country and in Washington, D.C., and really brought this issue to the forefront once again and made it part of the national conversation and did force legislative change, particularly in Florida. Um, I think we're, we're very strategic now as a movement. Um, you know, I hear a lot from other organizations that one of the, the downfalls of, of other movements has been that organizations don't talk to one another and they don't communicate. And I think we have done a good job of that, even though there are now organizations like Every Town and Giffords and other state and city based organizations all across the country um, that have risen up in the last 10 years, we all communicate together. Um, and, and we're also focused on, on very pragmatic laws. For example, 
empowering local authorities to uh, disarm domestic abusers. These are laws that have support, that are common sense, um, and that aren't that difficult to pass on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, as we amassed our own political power, as we became stronger, the NRA became weaker. And, you know, I will tell you, I, I didn't realize when we first started this work that we would spend so much time on defense. I thought it would be offense. We spent a lot of time stopping bad bills. Um, we spend certainly a lot of time passing good bills too, um, but we also go up against the NRA in electoral cycles. We outspent them for the first time in 2018. Um, and, and, you know, since then, as the NRA has become weakened, we have become stronger. And, you know, I would argue that um, the, the, the NRA as we know it is gone. That doesn't mean that they can't um, still play a role. It doesn't mean that the Senate isn't still playing from an old playbook. It doesn't mean that another organization can't rise up in the NRA stead. But because of our organ organizing, because there is a movement that can go toe, toe to toe with them now, um, the, the NRA will never be as powerful as it once was. So when you look at, you know, how we have evolved over the last decade, you know, I kind of told you just now how we came to be who we are now. Um, you know, a lot of what we have done has been data driven. And it is so important to look at uh, very specific policies that are going to be life saving. And that's really what we focus on. For example, we know that background checks are the foundation to any gun safety um, uh, network. And so we really have to have background checks to build on. And that's why we've passed them now in 21 states. Um, we've also worked very hard to marry our, our legislative and our electoral goals. So for example, if, if there is a state um, that has not passed good gun laws, then we know we have to change the power in the House or the Senate, and then we can go back in and we can change laws. And, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we have to play offense, we have to play defense, and then I think it's also really important to show that we are rolling back uh, bad legislation. So if you live in a state, maybe a red state with really bad gun laws, it is not hopeless. You can still change the electoral makeup in your state and go in and roll back those laws, and I'll talk about that more later too. Um, we have uh, worked on ballot initiatives and we passed ballot initiatives, for example, in the state of Washington. Um, we were able to uh, get them to pass background checks that way through a ballot initiative. We completely bypassed the state legislature. Um, we work at changing policy in school boards and city councils in the state house, um, and then holding lawmakers accountable. If you don't pass this legislation, you will pay a price when the next election cycle comes. And I'm gonna go into more specific examples, but um, it is my understanding that Lucy is joining us now. And so I wanna make sure that we have time for this conversation. Lucy. Are you there? There you are. Hello, hi. It's so wonderful to see you. Good to see you too, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Absolutely, I'm always excited to be with you and just thank you for your friendship and all the um, you know, organizers. Thank you all for being so committed to your leadership. I really appreciate you. So, Congresswoman, I, I would love for you and, and, and the audience, keep in mind, you know, a lot of, of them are college students, some are moms to be in action volunteers, but we also have college students here who may consider getting into advocacy or even running for office. So would you mind just telling your story and, and include in there your journey from, from activist to lawmaker? Absolutely. Um... As many of you know, on November 23rd, uh, my son Jordan and three of her fr his friends in Jacksonville, Florida, were sitting in the back seat of uh, a friend's car, Jordan's friend's car, when a man who objected to the to the type of music that the boys were playing uh, and the volume of the music, he unloaded, um, you know, uh, his hidden firearm that he had in his glove box. He unloaded that at <laughs> fully to all the teenagers, all the boys in the car. Um, you know, my son and, and his friends, they were completely unarmed. Uh, they had no weapons whatsoever in the car, just basketballs, footballs, and as we saw, dirty gym socks and things of that nature. And it was clear that the murderer was threatened by, um, as what he referred to my boy as, you know, 
you know, that he considered Jordan and his friends thugs, uh, gangbangers, he called them, and that they were playing thug music loudly in their car. So during the trial, um, it took us, you know, quite a bit of time through two trials. Uh, Jordan's uh, murder attempted to use stand your ground laws to justify shooting at the boys. Uh, and time and time again in our nation, you know, we have these kinds of experiences of gun violence tragedies. They're just not, I mean, they continue to happen every single day. And these kinds of tragedies just keep ripping apart our families. Uh, and, you know, this kind of really creating more and more empty seats at our kitchen tables. And, you know, during our holiday um, celebrations, and I just knew that this country could do better. I knew that we needed to do better. And so um, I actually spent a lot of time with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America and Every Town for Gun Safety. They gave me a voice, allowed me to not only tell my story, but to help build this grassroots movement uh, for gun safety advocacy in the country as a survivor. Um, and so I just, um, translated that into running for office, standing up to run for office, um, because I recognized that even though I had lost my son, I am still a mother. Uh, and that meant that I really felt on my heart that I wanted to advocate for more families to pre prevent them from ever kind of ever having to deal with the loss and the pain uh, that I have and my family has dealt with. Thank you for telling that story. I'm sure it's not easy. Congresswoman, when you were an advocate, because you jumped into advocacy so soon after Jordan was murdered and just became such a force, not just where you lived in your city or your state, but all across the, the country, what has it been like to be on the side of trying to impact legislation as an activist versus moving to trying to impact legislation as a member of Congress? Well, I mean, definitely, I have to say that all of everything that I do is enhanced. And a lot of the work and the policymaking that I've been able to do has definitely been enhanced and influenced by my advocacy. Uh, what I have come to understand is that as a policymaker, of course, top down, we're creating the policies um, to protect and save lives, but it really is that work that is done on the ground. It is really that work that's done in the grassroots movement building, the volunteers, the survivors, the victims, uh, and people who have not been affected by gun violence, but really consider uh, advocacy a, a really um, important part of their lives. Um, it takes a marrying, a marriage of both of those to really make sure that we are addressing the systemic problems that we have in gun violence in America. And that without the marriage of the two, then I don't ever see how we can move forward and really critically impact policy and, and policy that keeps our families and our community safe. And so I have been very grateful for all that I've learned uh, in movement building, all that I've learned being on the front lines as an advocate and an activist in gun safety, because it really has helped to craft my vision as to how I move forward as a policymaker, but also engaging this whole movement, engaging the movement in the policymaking. And I think that's been something that we've seen in Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and the tobacco industry or, you know, fighting for the LGBTQ rights or, you know, for um, women's rights uh, to health care choices. And I think that is something that's needed to happen in gun violence uh, prevention. And now I, I am really excited to help be able to facilitate that marriage because that is how we get policy truly um, passed in Washington. Well, and Congresswoman, I should mention that that in, in part you were inspired to run for office after the tragedy in Parkland, Florida, which happened four years ago today. Um, you're serving your second term, you're running for your third, and you have walked the walk. I mean, as soon as you were elected 
to office. You put forward legislation that passed the House for the first time in decades. Can you talk a little bit about that vision and, and, and what you've accomplished as a member of Congress? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, I recognized, you know, very early on, I mean, I knew I ran on a gun safety platform uh, here in Ruby Red, Georgia. And I now hold the seat that was once held by New Gingrich. So it tells you the climate in which we are combating gun violence here in Georgia as a red state and what the politics is like. Um, but I never backed down from that because I recognized that it was really going to be extremely critical to change hearts and minds. And to do that, you do have to do, I think, absolutely as a victim, as a survivor, that has had great impact on my ability to be able to run on a, a platform of gun safety and to actually be able to, in Washington for the first time, um, you know, <laughs> be able to help champion and pass in the House of Representatives background checks for all gun sales uh, to, I, I, you know, I'm just, I know people say, but it's not past the Senate. Yes, yes, we understand that. But for the first time to be able to, as, a, as someone who's been impacted by gun violence and now as a policymaker, help to really build that movement internally with my colleagues in Washington to get them to move and be encouraged to pass this legislation is monumental. And so all of the advocacy work that I've done um, it's really important to kind of, you know, help in delivering um, gun violence policy that is passing the House of Representatives. We are going to be bringing forth my bill, red flag bill, um, very, very, sh in a very short span of time. And I am assured that that bill will pass in the House simply because we do have the numbers of people, uh, also Republicans that are wanting to pass that piece of legislation as well. And so um, I'm really encouraged. I always say to people is that, you know, this kind of advocacy, this kind of policy making is, is slow. It does not happen overnight. Shannon, as, as you've said many, many times, this is, a, you know, this is, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And it will take time to unravel um, a lot of the policies that have, you know, enabled the kinds of dangerous gun culture that we live in, it will take time to unravel that, but it will happen. I, I think you're exactly right, uh, especially with champions like you in Congress. We have, as I mentioned, students um, on, on this call today, and some of them may be thinking about becoming campaign managers or just getting involved in politics or even running for office when they graduate. What advice would you give them? Any thoughts now that you've been an advocate and a lawmaker? Um, I'm always happy to answer this question because I want young people, I want you to feel encouraged in spite of everything that you see and hear um, about what it means to run for office. I want you to feel encouraged and know that you have a voice and your voice truly, truly matters. And all of your lived experiences, everything that you have experienced really gives you a great credibility in being able to, to, to speak for communities. Uh, you can make a difference just by standing up and using your voice. You can make a difference um, by volunteering or staffing a campaign or <laughs> running for office yourself. I mean, this is what democracy looks like when you are actively engaged, you are actively participating, you're using your gifts and your talents and your skills to, to change a culture, to change the climate, to change policy. You can make a difference by speaking up and stepping out and don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to do it. I know people say, I don't have the means, I don't have the money, I don't have the manpower, I don't have the resources. Do it and those means and, and resources and manpower, they'll come find you. Yep, I think that's exactly true. Last question and again, Congresswoman, thank you for your valuable time today. You know, there's a frustration in this country. The only place this issue, for example, is polarizing is in the US Senate. The vast majority of Americans want change. And yet at a federal level, 
there hasn't been a lot, right? The, the Biden administration has done everything it can through executive order. Um, and yet what we really need is, is for the Senate to act. What do you say to anyone, but in particular young people who are frustrated, who maybe feel like it's not worth voting, who maybe feel like it's not worth getting off the sidelines because nothing ever changes, who may be a little apathetic, you know, what I want to say is that really frustration is is, is part of this game. <laughs> frustration as, uh, you know, someone who's engaged in your community, engaged in what your future looks like, that's part of the game because we never feel like it moves fast enough. We never feel like the change is hap happening quick enough. But as I said, you know, and I say over and over again, these are, this is a culture. Um, these are cultural policies that we're trying to change. And when you do that, it takes a long time. There is a lot of changing of hearts and minds. It does not happen overnight. Um, but what it is, it only takes one voice to show concern about a specific policy or the direction of the country that we're going in. And it only takes that one voice because there are others that begin to join in this groundswell. And so, I know you get frustrated, absolutely. We're all frustrated at some point in time as a policymaker, I'm frustrated that things aren't moving more quickly or that we're not able to get you know, certain pieces of legislation uh, passed in the Senate. But understand that's what democracy looks like. It is um, you know, many, many individuals with many different political ideologies and many people that have come from, from, with so many different lived experiences coming together uh, at the seat of, you know, at the table and using those experiences and those ideologies uh, to set the course of the future of the nation. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult. Sometimes it's hard to get people to see your vision or to see what you believe your constituents want, <laughs> want you to advocate for, for them in Washington or wherever it is that you live. Um, but understand is that it's just a continuous, you know, going back to the table, you go back over and over and over again, and slowly there's that evolution of change and it will happen. It always does happen. That's the reason why the United States of America is one of the most successful democracies in the world, because we've continuously been able to do that. And so don't give up. Um, I know it can be difficult. I know it can be challenging, but nothing ever, ever worth having uh, is ever so easily gained without really championing for it and, and, and really working hard to achieve it. And you are a prime example of, of that steadfastness. So thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for telling your story, but, but even more than that, thank you for always being on the right side of this issue and for making sure that it's a priority for Congress and for really being brave and courageous in, in the face of extremism. Thank you. Well, thank you. You've, you've given me the ability to fight right alongside you. And you're definitely a champion in my book as well. My Shiro, she's one of my Shiro's. <laughs> well, you're mine. Thank you, Congresswoman. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. So let's get back to our discussion. Let me go into full screen here. Okay. so. Where we left off was uh, talking about some examples of legislative wins. And I want to go back really quickly to around 2012 and, and not long after. Um, what we saw when we got involved as activists is that even though the what was called Mansion Toomey, so that was a bill put forward by Senators Manchin and Senator Toomey, one a Democrat, one a Republican, both very moderate. Um, they put together a bill that would have closed the background check loophole that allows gun sales without a background check on private or unlicensed sales. The, the licensed sales in this country require a background check, unlicensed don't. That loophole would have been closed. Millions of guns are sold without a background check every year because of this loophole, and it failed by a handful of votes in the Senate. I think we thought, okay, our work here is done. You know, This isn't going to happen, and then what we saw were that states some governors did have the appetite 
uh, to pass legislation that that would regulate guns where where in their states and Connecticut was a prime example of that in large part because that's where the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy happened. Um, the legislature put forward and the governor signed into law legislation that redefined what an assault weapons what what, what an assault weapon was and banned many models of them. Um, it also addressed uh, background checks and required them on on all slides and or, I'm sorry on all gun sales. And so that that was a signal to us that maybe states and cities would do what Congress would and, and we were right. Um, the other piece of this, and I mentioned this a minute ago when I was talking about ballot initiatives, was that there were states where it was very clear that constituents wanted stronger gun laws. Uh, the, the legislature was still playing from the NRA playbook. Um, maybe we didn't have as many Democratic allies, for example, and we couldn't get it either through the legislation, uh, the um, the the state house or we couldn't get it signed into law by the governor and i can give you many examples of, of where that was the case but i think washington is a is a prime example because it's the first state where we decided to do ballot initiative only about two dozen states allow that type of legislation to be passed where you can actually get enough signatures on a ballot that you can then um, go in and support this legislation being passed and, and really bypassing um, the legislature. And, and we were able to do that in Washington state. And so because of our ballot initiative, because of the work we did to get voters to vote yes on our ballot and initiative, and trust me when I say the NRA and the gun lobby did everything they could to stop that, including um, using language that would actually trick voters into to voting against background checks, that did pass and it is now the law in the state of Washington that you have to have a background check on every gun sale. Um, and then we also saw some states as places where we could innovate. For example, after the shooting tragedy at UCSB in California, um, we found out that you know these parents had said to police, my son, our son is a danger to himself or others. He's armed, please help. And they said, look, there's nothing we can do. There's no law that allows us to remove his guns and, and determine the threat. And so uh, just a few states at the time, I think five, had red flag laws in place. And these are laws that have often bipartisan support um, that are constitutionally sound, that are shown to have due process, and that really do uh, effectively mitigate either mass shootings or domestic gun violence or, or even suicide. And so in the state of California, we passed a new modern and, 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 and truly robust red flag law that allows family members or police to petition a judge to get a temporary restraining order that removes the guns from someone who is a danger to themselves or others until that risk can be determined. And so since then, we've actually passed that now in nearly 20 states. Loss is a big part of activism. You don't get involved in something like gun violence prevention and expect to win every time. Um, you know, it, it, it is important to recognize that you will lose, but it is also important to learn from those losses. And so when, one of the things the NRA did pretty quickly is to go into red states and say, OK, maybe blue states is where this movement is going to start passing what we call good gun laws. They call them bad. So we'll go into red states where they can't necessarily stop us. And, and one of the first places they did that was in Georgia, where they passed something called Guns Everywhere. It allowed guns in daycares and in bars and in churches and even in parts of the airport. And uh, even though we generated way more calls and emails against this this legislation, uh, the governor signed it into law anyway. And uh, it was a, an early wake up call for us that it wasn't just about the majority supporting gun safety. Uh, you were going to have to be really strategic and create these coalitions that that would make a difference when when the NRA was trying to pass these laws. Um, Arkansas, their guns on campus bill, I think, is a really important example. You know, we did not have much of a chapter in the state of Arkansas. It was just, you know, a year or two after the Sandy Hook school shooting tragedy. And the NRA went in and forced a guns on campus, campus bill through the legislature. Uh, it was signed into law by the governor who was standing next to the chief NRA lobbyist when he, when he signed it. And it even allowed guns inside uh, stadiums like Razorback Stadium or at tailgates. It was absolutely absurd. And it so angered particularly women and moms in the state of Arkansas, that our chapter grew exponentially overnight. In fact, we got so large that we were able to go in and, and carve out 
an exemption so that you could not bring guns into the stadium. And in fact, our own volunteers the next year ran for office, two of them won, including a retired nurse who beat the man, the legislator who put the guns on campus bill forward by about, I think it was 12 points, beat him handily, um, and really changed the face of activism in Arkansas. Now, I'm not gonna pretend we win every battle in Arkansas, we don't, but at least there is a very robust opposition to the gun lobby there. Um, and Kansas, permitless carry early on, uh, that, that was a battle with the NRA, where they were fighting for guns on college campuses and permitless carry, and, and we, they got what they wanted in the state of Arkansas, sadly, but at the same time, it was the warning sign to us that this was their strategy, that they were going to attempt to pass permitless carry either at a federal level or at the state level, and that's exactly what they've done. Um, and, and then how we've evolved as an organization and our legislative strategy, um, Colorado, I think is a really good example. I, I actually lived in Colorado for about five years uh, when Moms Demand Action was in its sort of in its um, new stages. And it, it was, I would say, a purple state with very red and very blue cities. And we were not able to pass gun safety legislation except for what was passed after the horrific Aurora theater shooting tragedy, uh, Governor Hickenlooper, now Senator, passed sweeping gun reform legislation that really energized the gun extremists in, in the state. And so we were sort of at a standstill. And that was in part because we did not have a Senate majority there. And so we did a lot of electoral work to change the makeup. And that was when we won the Senate, we were able to pass a lot of really strong gun laws, including things like secure storage. But most importantly, what we've done, and I mentioned earlier that the NRA has learned a lot from other lobbying organizations um, and other special interests, what they learned was that they wanted to not be sued, <laughs> as most manufacturers don't, um, but no other manufacturer has what the NRA has or what gun manufacturers have, and that is um, something called immunity. And, and that means that they can't be sued over product malfunctions or false advertising. There, there are ways around it, maybe, but, but for the most part, they have this blanket protection from being sued. And the reason they have that, sorry, I'm, I'm actually talking about PLACA. Um, let me talk about PLACA because I'm already talking about this. So the NRA can't be sued. So we went into New York and we passed laws that then allow the gun lobby to sue gun manufacturers. That, that is a new innovation that we were able to do in the state of New York. Let me go back to Colorado. Preemption laws, sorry, I messed up plaque and preemption. Preemption laws are something the NRA learned from other special interests, which is you can go into a, a, a state and you can pass a preemption law that prevents state lawmakers from, that prevents cities from passing policies that are different than state law. So let me explain that again. So cities cannot have policies that are different than state law. So if you were in Boulder, for example, you could walk up and down Pearl Street with an AR-15, but not a dog. And the reason for that was because state laws did not allow the city to pass any kind of policy that was different from state law. So we went in after we changed the makeup of the Senate and we were able to get uh, that preemption law rolled back through the legislature. It's one of the first states, 45 states have preemption laws. And it was one of the first states in the nation that went in and undid that law. So now Boulder can put back in place its assault weapons ban. So now Denver can have different policies and Colorado Springs and on and on and on. And, and it would be a great goal to have that in other states. Um, and, and so I, I really am heartened by the fact that Colorado has been able to undo its preemption law. We'll be trying to do that in other states. Now, let me go back to PLACA. So New York, I think you would assume New York would be able to pass strong gun laws. And in fact, there was a similar situation where we had a senator who was a Democrat, but, but not interested in passing stronger gun laws. So PLACA, PLACA is a federal law. The, the gun lobby learned from other special interests that they didn't wanna be sued, they passed PLACA through a federal level, through Congress, which gave them blanket immunity essentially from being sued for their products, which I, which I said a moment ago. And it, it is 
because of that um, protection that they are such a strong and robust special interest. It's why they have so much money. They're never sued. They're not spending money necessarily on lawsuits. It is what crippled the, the tobacco lobby and, and ultimately also the, the alcohol lobby. So the, the gun lobby learned a lot from from special interests and got that passed at federal level. However, we now are learning because we were able to, through an electoral cycle, win back the Senate in New York with gun sense candidates, we then just this last legislative session passed a law that overturns PLACA. So it's a really innovative way to say, okay, federal law does not allow us to do something, but we can actually make a real difference in the states. And so I'm really excited to see that. Uh, it be replicated in other states. And then let me go to Virginia. I know I'm going out of order here. Uh, Virginia, when I started Moms Demand Action, was an incredibly red state. Even the Democratic US senators in that state were voting with the gun lobby. So much has changed in the last decade. Um, for example, in 2019, uh, we were able to win an election cycle that um, changed both control of both houses of the General Assembly. And so then we were able to go in and pass really strong gun laws. And one of the laws that we wanted to pass was, it's not undoing preemption, but it's giving more local control to cities so that they could in turn pass policies that prohibit guns in sensitive places. So for example, polling places or the state house or government buildings. And so that's exactly what our volunteers have done. They've gone, uh, county board by county board, city council by city council, and they have passed these policies that prevent guns in sensitive places. And now I think it's over 2 million Virginians are, are protected by these new policies and laws. So another really innovative way, if you don't have a, a great uh, legislature in, in place, then you can uh, pass these other laws that allow a lot more local control and a lot of change that really does impact uh, everyday citizens. So, um, you know, that's, I think, a, a really excellent model. So let's go to the next step slide. So I want to talk a little bit about um, next steps. Oops, sorry. So if you're interested in learning more, about this issue. Um, if you are um, wanting to get involved, if you are thinking about how to get political skills uh, so that you can impact legislation, one great way to do that is to start a Students Demand Action chapter. There is no Students Demand Action, action chapter on uh, American University's campus. So you can either go to studentsdemandaction.org to learn more about how to do that, or you can text the word students directly to 64433. Um, and I would just encourage all of you to do that. It would be so great to, to have a, a chapter on site at American University. And then also there are a lot of local gun violence organizations that are working on legislation at the policy level. Obviously DC um, is a different animal when it comes to uh, not having a state house, but you can still work on policy through, for example, the Trey Ron Center, um, through Cure the Streets, through DC United. Um, a lot of those organizations are focused on stopping city gun violence, and there's so much that can be done on that front. Uh, it's not just policy, it's also getting um, the city council to, for example, unlock dollars that can go to these programs. Um, and then there are a lot of podcasts that, that you can listen to and learn more. Um, Affirming Our Lane, Evidence for Change, um, Victims to Victorious, these are all a podcast that you can subscribe to, learn more about what's happening if you're interested in gun violence in Washington, D.C., but also if you are interested in getting involved um, in legislation, maybe where you live, maybe if you don't live in D.C. and you're a student from another state, again, a really important way to get involved and show up, for example, at school boards and, and organize around secure storage or show up at your city council and get them to pass amazing innovative policy like for example we have in, in San, San Jose recently or even go to your state house. You can do that also through Students Demand Action. Students Demand Action is now the largest student run gun violence reform uh, organization in the country. Again, studentsdemandaction.org or text students to 64433. So I know this was a little bit of a long one. Thank you for hanging in there. Hope you got a lot out of those conversations uh, with two members of Congress who I'm so incredibly proud started and, and cut their teeth as Moms Demand Action volunteers. 
Um, and, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, look forward to seeing you again on March 14th, and I hope to see you in person. So please consider joining March 14th. We're going to be talking about electoral strategy. We'll also have special guests again, um, some elected officials from Virginia. And I will see you then. Thanks so much.